Is not all of philosophy as if written in honey, Albert Einstein once remarked. It looks wonderful when one contemplates it. But when one looks again, it's all gone. Only mush remains. Did he know what he was talking about? Well, in Subtle is the Lord, his wonderful biography of Einstein, Abraham Pace claims twice that Einstein studied philosophical writings throughout his life, beginning in his high school days when he first read Kant. Science without epistemology, Pace quotes Einstein as saying, is, insofar as it is thinking at all, primitive and muddled. When Einstein went on to say which particular epistemology is needed to rescue science from a primitive muddle, his answer seems to have been all of them. The scientist, Einstein declared, must appear to the systematic epistemologist as a type of unscrupulous opportunist. He goes on, he appears as a realist insofar as he seeks to describe a world independent of the acts of perception. An idealist insofar as he looks upon the concepts and theories of, as the free inventions of the human spirit. As a positivist insofar as he considers his concepts and theories justified only to the extent to which they furnish a logical representation of relations among sensory experiences. He may even appear as a Platonist or Pythagorean insofar as he considers the viewpoint of logical simplicity as an indispensable and effective tool of his research. As evidence of Einstein's supposed lifelong interest in philosophy, this is fairly un unconvincing and tends rather to lend weight to Pice's own somewhat dismissive and occasionally even disapproving attitude to the impact of philosophy on Einstein's thinking. Calling Einstein a philosopher, Pice remarks, sheds as much light on him as calling him a musician. It's a remark that could go either way, of course, but it is, I think, pretty clear which direction Pice wants it to go. One is reminded of Frederick Raphael's quip, Einstein was great, and he played the violin, but that does not make him a great violinist. Dropping metaphor for plain speech, Pice declares, there can be as little doubt that philosophy stretched Einstein's personality as that his philosophical knowledge played no direct role in his major creative efforts. The only serious role that Pice acknowledges Einstein's philosophical commitments to have had on his physics is one that he considers to have been disastrous. Einstein's objections to quantum physics, Pice maintains, were at bottom driven by philosophical commitments, and all the worse for that. Whether we agree or disagree with Pice about that, we keep coming up against a basic lack of evidence about what form exactly Einstein's interest in philosophy took. Though he has evidently taken a special interest in this area of Einstein's intellectual life, Pice can offer only inconclusive and sporadic information about Einstein's interest in and knowledge of philosophy. For example, that he read Kant as a schoolboy, that with his friends in Bern, he studied Spinoza's ethics, Hume's treatise, and Mill's logic that he was familiar with Bertrand Russell's theory of knowledge, and that, among the Oriental philosophers, he appreciated Confucius. Once in Princeton, Pice adds, Einstein fell asleep during a lecture on Zen Buddhism. But he goes on, perhaps he was tired that evening. More or less the only evidence of a sustained interest in actually discussing philosophy that Pice can offer is contained in his rather laconic sentence, quote, in 1943, Einstein, Gödel, Bertrand Russell, and Pauli gathered at Einstein's home to discuss philosophy of science about half a dozen times. The source for this is Russell's own autobiography, where these discussions are described as follows. The latter part of our time in America was spent at Princeton, where we had a little house on the shores of the lake. While in Princeton, I came to know Einstein fairly well, I used to go to his house once a week to discuss with him and Gödel and Pauli. These discussions were in some ways disappointing, for although all three of them were Jews and exiles, and in intention cosmopolitan, I found that they all had a German bias towards metaphysics. And in spite of our utmost endeavors, we never arrived at common premises from which to argue. Gödel turned out to be an unadulterated Platonist, and apparently believed that an eternal not was laid up in heaven, where virtuous logicians might hope to meet it hereafter. <laughs>
End of quote. Soon after Russell's death, this passage was drawn to Gödel's attention by Kenneth Blackwell, the Russell archivist at McMaster University, who naturally wanted to know more about these discussions. Somewhat uncharacteristically, Gödel did actually bother to reply to Blackwell. Entirely characteristically, however, he never posted his reply. <laughs> and it was not discovered until after his death. In it, he drew attention to some inaccuracies in Russell's account. First, he said, not that it matters, he stressed, he was not in fact Jewish. Second, the impression given by Russell that they had several meetings was, he thought, false. He could remember only one. Finally, Gödel wrote, concerning my unadulterated Platonism, it is no more unadulterated than Russell's own in 1921, when in the introduction to mathematical philosophy, he said, logic is concerned with the real world just as truly as zoology though with its more abstract and general features. At that time, evidently, Russell had met them not even in this world. But later, under the influence of Wittgenstein, he chose to overlook it. Gödel's reply to Blackwell makes one wonder what might have happened if Einstein had met Russell not in 1943, but in 1905, a year that has gone down in intellectual history. Not only is the year in which Einstein's theory of relativity was first published, but also is the year in which Russell published his seminal contribution to thought on denoting, an article which, while not as widely known to the general public as that in which Einstein first introduced M equals MC, E equals MC squared, is, among analytic philosophers, every bit as canonical. This year, for every international conference of scientists and historians of science celebrating 100 years of relativity, there is an international conference of philosophers and historians of philosophy celebrating the centenary of on denoting. A meeting between Einstein and Russell in 1905 would have been a very different event to that which took place in Princeton in 1943. For then Russell himself would have been steeped in the German bias towards metaphysics that he attributes to Einstein, Pauli and Gödel. And as Gödel says, the particular metaphysics in which he would have been steeped was a Platonism every bit as unadulterated as Gödel's own. In this lecture, then, I want to give some account of Russell's early philosophy, focusing in particular on, on denoting, and to place his philosophical achievements alongside those of his, some of his contemporaries, Frege, Husserl, and Poincaré. The result, I hope, will be a depiction of an intellectual landscape, a landscape that provides the background both to the twists and turns of Western philosophy throughout the 20th century, and also more immediately to Einstein's momentous discoveries and announcements of 1905. The first thing a contemporary philosopher would notice about this intellectual landscape, as compared with that of today, is how integrated it is. Since the Second World War, an unfortunate split has occurred in philosophy, separating English-speaking philosophers from their French and German contemporaries. The usual way of characterizing this split is to describe it as a separation between, on the one hand, analytic philosophy, and on the other, continental philosophy. A categorization that Bernard Williams has remarked is rather like trying to group cars into two classes, four-wheel drive models and those made in Japan. Analytic refers to a type of philosophy, continental to a geographical region. The split between analytic and continental philosophy is particularly unfortunate because the origins of analytic philosophy lie precisely on the continent. Or rather, they lie in the meeting of minds between Bertrand Russell and his continental contemporaries. They lie, in fact, in the determination of Russell to shake off the insularity of his Cambridge education and to embrace the progress in both philosophy and the sciences that had been made on the continent. That determination, together with the willingness of continental thinkers to engage with Russell, and the comparative openness of European cultural life at that time, ensured that by 1905, Russell lived and worked in a more cosmopolitan, a more genuinely international intellectual environment than would be possible for philosophers today, despite the advantages of the internet and cheap air travel. Even by the standards of the day, of course, Russell himself was exceptionally cosmopolitan. At one conference, he drew applause from delegates when, having been asked by questions by a Frenchman, an Italian, and a German, he answered each in turn in their native language. 
Such linguistic feats were rare even then, but what was not rare was mutually rewarding intellectual contact, both between philosophers from different countries and between philosophers and scientists. Take, for example, my chosen four thinkers from 1905, Frege, Husserl, Poincaré, and Russell, a German, an Austrian, a Frenchman, and a Brit, two of whom are mathematicians and the other two philosophers, and yet all of whom regarded themselves as belonging to the same intellectual milieu. They read and reviewed each other's books, they responded to each other's published work, and they exchanged ideas and information with each other in private correspondence. Above all, perhaps, they criticized each other and listened to each other's criticisms of them. Frege's criticisms had a deep influence on Husserl, as did Poincaré's on Russell and Russell's on Frege. Compare that with the work of their followers. Only Fregeans and Russellians speak the same language today, and both on the whole remain defiantly ignorant of the work of Husserl and Poincaré. Meanwhile, Husserlians work in the continental tradition of phenomenology and thus remain, for the most part, cut off from the mainstream of English-speaking philosophy. And Poincaré, who in 1905 was far and away the best known and the most eminent of the four, is now a forgotten figure among philosophers and his work studied only by historians of science. What all four had in common was an interest in understanding the nature of mathematics, together with the conviction that the attempt to understand mathematics was central to philosophy as a whole. It is well known that the biggest, most decisive step that Russell took in his philosophical development was that of abandoning the neo-Hegelianism of his earliest philosophical writings in favor of what he called the philosophy of logical analysis. What is less well known is that this development was driven at every stage by Russell's reflections on mathematics. Indeed, Russell became a philosopher in order to think about mathematics. In his autobiography, he describes in rhapsodic terms the intellectual excitement he experienced when he was first taught geometry and the pervasive influence that that excitement had in shaping his earliest philosophical endeavors. The first thing that led me to philosophy, he writes, occurred at the age of 11. It was then that his older brother Frank taught him Euclid's system of geometry. And, Russell goes on, it was one of the great events in my life, as dazzling as first love. I had not imagined that there could be anything so delicious in the world. After I had learned the fifth proposition, my brother told me that it was generally considered difficult, but I had no difficulty whatsoever. This was the first time it dawned on me that I might have some intelligence. And from that moment, until Whitehead and I finished Principia Mathematica when I was 38, mathematics was my chief interest and my chief source of happiness. Like all happiness, however, it was not an alloy. I had been told that Euclid proved things and was much disappointed that he started with axioms. At first, I refused to accept them unless my brother could offer me some reason for doing so. But he said, if you don't accept them, we can't go on. And as I wished to go on, I reluctantly accepted them, pro tem. The doubt as to the premises of mathematics, which I felt at that moment, remained with me and determined the course of my subsequent work. End of quote. The delight he took in learning Euclid's geometry was aroused by the feeling of finally coming to know something with complete certainty. The beauty of Euclid's system is that it is axiomatic. Everything that it teaches about circles, triangles, squares, etc. is not just stated but proved. Complicated and surprising things about the relation between angles and lengths and so on are shown to be merely logical consequences of a few simple axioms. It's as if a whole vast body of knowledge had been spun out of virtually nothing. But more than that, this body of knowledge is not tentative or provisional. It does not depend upon the contingencies of the world, but rather can be established once and for all. If one accepts the axioms, one has to accept the rest. No further doubt is possible. To someone who wishes, as Russell passionately wished, to find reasons for their belief, beliefs, the exhilarating possibility it opens up is that some beliefs at least can be provided with absolutely cast-iron foundations. And this aroused in Russell the hope of applying mathematics to the physical world and to human behavior. But apart from that, there was another aspect to the delight that the young Russell found in Euclidean geometry that was to influence his philosophical development enormously 
And that was the introduction it provided him to what philosophers often call Plato's world of ideas. As he was later to put it in History of Western Philosophy, quote, Mathematics is, I believe, the chief source of the belief in eternal and exact truth, as well as in a super-sensible, intelligible world. Geometry deals with exact circles, but no sensible object is exactly circular. However carefully we may use our compasses, there will be some imperfections and irregularities. This suggests the view that all exact reasoning applies to ideal as opposed to sensible objects. It is natural to go further and to argue that thought is nobler than sense, and the objects of thought more real than those of sense perception. End of quote. In his essay, Why I Took to Philosophy, Russell made clear the importance this form of mysticism had for his own philosophical motivations. Quote, for a time I found satisfaction in a doctrine derived with modification from Plato. According to Plato's doctrine, which I accepted only in a watered down form, there is an unchanging, timeless world of ideas of which the world presented to our senses is an imperfect copy. Mathematics, according to this doctrine, deals with the world of ideas and has in consequence an exactness and perfection which is absent from the everyday world. This kind of mathematical mysticism, which Plato derived from Pythagoras, appealed to me." End of quote. So we can see that if the young Russell had encountered the unadulterated Platonism he found in Gödel in 1943, he would not have dismissed it as something alien and foreign a German bias towards metaphysics. Rather, he would have seen in it something deeply, even intimately, familiar to him. In order to maintain belief in the platonic world of ideas given to us by mathematics, however, we have, as a bare minimum, to believe that mathematics is consistent. And that, throughout the 2,000 years or so that philosophers have occupied themselves with this question, has provided a persistently difficult stumbling block in the first place, there was the ancient Greek discovery of incommensurables. Quantities like the square root of 2 and pi, the existence of which could be demonstrated by simple calculations, but which could not be expressed as the ratio of two whole numbers. Quantities that were, in other words, irrational. The Greeks had no adequate solution to this, and for the most part were inclined to regard it as an illustration of the fact that there were some areas of mathematics where geometry could go but arithmetic could not follow. But the platonic world of exactness and perfection is essentially an arithmetic world. Its essence is to do with the relation between numbers. So for Platonists, a different approach is required. This was not provided until the 19th century when the German mathematician Richard Dedekind provided a definition of real numbers, including so-called irrationals, that overcame the problems of incommensurability and could regard, say, pi and the square root of 2 as points on the real number continuum like any others, i.e. just numbers like others. At the same time, other German mathematicians, most notably Georg Cantor and Karl Weierstrass, turned their attention to the problems of infinity, continuity, and the infinitesimal, problems that had, like that of incommensurables, persuaded some philosophers that mathematics was incurably blighted by contradiction. Together, Dedekind, Cantor, and Weierstrass provided a whole new foundation for mathematics, one that became taught to students of mathematics under the title of Analysis, the title derived from the endeavors of those mathematicians to remove inconsistencies in mathematics by providing its central notions with consistent definitions based on rigorous logical analysis. In other words, their work represents the beginning of a movement to provide mathematics with a sound, logical foundation. A movement inspired in the minds of at least some of its most prominent leaders, most notably Georg Cantor, by a desire to remove the intellectual barriers in the way of embracing Platonism. When Russell was an undergraduate student of mathematics at Cambridge, the pioneering work of Dedekind, Cantor, and Weierstrass had already been published, and on the continent was already shaping the way mathematics was taught and researched. In Cambridge, however, it was resolutely ignored. And much to his later disgust, Russell did not know anything about it until after he had switched from mathematics to philosophy and was traveling around the world giving philosophy papers. 
As we have seen, Russell chose to study mathematics primarily for philosophical reasons. He wanted to find solutions to the questions about the premises of mathematics, rudimentary versions of which had occurred to him at the age of 11. He switched to philosophy because he found that the mathematicians at Cambridge, unlike, though he did not know that then, their contemporaries in Germany, were not at all interested in foundational questions, preferring to think about and teach mathematics as a collection of useful techniques rather than as a metaphysical body of truth. The leading philosophers at Cambridge when Russell was an undergraduate, i.e. during the last decade of the 19th century, were interested in the logical paradoxes that bedeviled mathematics. They were not, however, interested in finding mathematical solutions to those paradoxes. Rather, their interest was in using the paradoxes to argue for the met metaphysical system known as Neo-Hegelianism, which was then the dominant philosophy, both at Oxford, where its most influential adherent was F.H. Bradley, and at Cambridge, where its chief exponent and the biggest influence on Russell's earliest philosophy was James McTaggart. Russell's conversion to Neo-Hegelianism came about mainly through his contacts with McTaggart, both in person and through reading McTaggart's studies in the Hegelian dialectic, which was widely influential among Cambridge philosophers of the 1890s. McTaggart's emphasis was on the interconnectedness of everything, as perceived by Hegel's philosophy. Separateness, according to this doctrine, is an illusion, and is shown to be such by a dialectic that proceeds from the lower categories of understanding, things like space, time, and matter, to the highest, the absolute. Only this latter is independent and real, and only this is rational. All the lower categories are enmeshed in contradictions that are resolved by successive synthesis until one reaches the absolute. In this vision, analogous in some respects to the kind of platonic mysticism to which Russell was initially attracted, logic and religion meet for the logic of the dialectic shows us that, in McTaggart's words, all reality is rational and righteous. The highest object of philosophy is to indicate to us the general nature of an ultimate harmony, the full content of which it has not yet entered into our hearts to conceive. Inspired by McTaggart's work, Russell spent a few years in the 1890s writing philosophical papers on mathematics that chided mathematicians for blithely ignoring the paradoxes at the heart of their discipline, the existence of which was revealed, the existence of which revealed the truth of Hegelian idealism. When he discovered that outside Cambridge, mathematics was being shaped precisely by its concern with these paradoxes, his attitude swung exactly the opposite direction. It was then that the big break in his philosophical development mentioned before occurred, a break he liked to characterize as a shift away from conceiving the world as a bowl of jelly towards conceiving it as a bucket of shot. In other words, it was a shift from synthesis to analysis. Perhaps the shift from synthesis to analysis. The moment that analytic philosophy was born. In the first flush of his enthusiasm for the work of Cantor, Dedekind and Weierstrass, Russell celebrated their achievement and its philosophical implications with a kind of messianic triumphalism. It is, he wrote, the greatest achievement of which our age has to boast. Adding, I know of no age, except perhaps the golden age of Greece, which has a more convincing proof to offer of the transcendent genius of its great men. As to what exactly they had achieved, the way he put it was this. One of the chief triumphs of modern mathematics consists in having discovered what mathematics really is. All pure mathematics, arithmetic, analysis, and geometry, is built up by combinations of the primitive ideas of logic, and its propositions are deduced from the general axioms of logic, such as the syllogism and the other rules of inference. And this is no longer a dream or an aspiration. On the contrary, over the greater and more difficult part of the domain of mathematics, it has already been accomplished. In the remaining cases, there is no special difficulty, and it is now being rapidly achieved. Philosophers have disputed for ages whether such deduction was possible. Mathematicians have sat down and made the deduction. For the philosophers, there is now nothing left but graceful acknowledgement. End of quote. What Cantor, Weierstrass, and Dedekind had achieved in supplying mathematics with logical foundations, according to Russell, was a demonstration of a hugely important philosophical insight about the nature of mathematics. Namely, that mathematics was logic. 
Nowadays, under the influence of Wittgenstein, we would tend to think that this insight, if true, would point away from Platonism. But for Russell at this period, it was entirely consistent with Platonism, since he took a robustly Platonic view of logic itself. The German mathematicians had shown that mathematics was logic, and logic, Russell believed, was the Platonic science par excellence, a study of abstract, objectively existing forms that had all the exactness, perfection, and immutability that one could wish for. Inspired by what he saw as the momentous achievement of Cantor, Weierstrass, and Dedekind then, Russell formulated a vastly ambitious plan, which in its essence he conceived as little more than dotting the I's and crossing the T's of the work of these German mathematicians, of demonstrating theorem by theorem that mathematics was logic. He would do this by building on and generalizing the work of the Italian mathematician Giuseppe Piano, whom he met at the famous International Congress in Berlin in 1900. By using a specially invented logical notation, Piano was able to show that the whole of arithmetic could be founded upon a system that used only three basic notions and five initial axioms. To so reduce the whole of arithmetic was a tremendous achievement, and Russell was fulsome in his praise of it. But he thought that Piano had not quite reached rock bottom. Piano's basic notions, he was convinced, could be reduced yet further by defining them in terms of the logically still more primitive notion of class. If an axiomatic theory of classes could be constructed in which Piano's basic notions were definable and his five axioms dem demonstrable, then, Russell reasoned, arithmetic could be shown conclusively to be nothing more than logic. This is the central idea of his great work, The Principles of Mathematics, the first draft of which he finished at the end of 1900, just months after his meeting with Piano. In public, Russell was fulsome in his acknowledgement of the importance of the work of others and self-effacing about the significance of his own contributions. In private, however, this decorum was abandoned. When he finished the first draft of The Principles of Mathematics, he wrote to his friend Margaret Llewellyn Davis, I invented a new subject, which turned out to be all of mathematics, for the first time treated in its essence. As Russell was to discover a few months later, however, he had been anticipated on almost every point in his supposed invention of this new subject by the German mathematician Gottlob Frege. Over 20 years earlier, Frege had published a book called The Griffschrift. now regarded as a seminal contribution to logic and philosophy, in which he introduced a new kind of logic, exactly the kind that Russell hoped to use as a foundation for the whole of mathematics. Unlike the innovations of Frege and Russell, logic and mathematics were regarded as completely separate intell until the time of the innovations of Frege and Russell. Logic and mathematics were regarded as completely separate intellectual disciplines, the one dealing with language, the other with quantity. The study of logic went hand in hand with the humanities, especially with classics and philo philology. The study of mathematics went hand in hand with science and technology. At the heart of the new kind of logic inaugurated by Frege and Russell was the introduction of a notion that brought logic and mathematics together, the notion of a propositional function. Frege's idea, first announced in the Griffschrift, was to apply the mathematical notion of a function to the analysis of language to see, in fact, a proposition as a function. At the heart of Frege's system of logic in the Griffith and of Russell's in the Principles of Mathematics is thus the notion of a propositional function. Broadly speaking, a propositional function is a proposition with a variable. So Plato is a man and Socrates is a man are propositions, but X is a man is a propositional function. From this notion, we can derive the allied notion of a class of objects. The class of men, for example, is defined as the objects for which X is a man is true. The objects which, to use Frege's jargon, satisfy that function. What Frege went on to do in the Foundations of Arithmetic, a book he published five years after the Griffith, was to use this notion of class to argue that arithmetic is just logic. The keystone of his argument was a definition of numbers as classes. Frege's idea was that since numbers were classes and class was a logical notion, it followed that arithmetic was logic. His project, exactly analogous to the one Russell formed for himself 20 years later, 
was to make the philosophical case for this position in the foundations of arithmetic. Then, in a multi-volume book he called The Fundamental Laws of Arithmetic, the first volume of which he published in 1893, he would produce the actual derivations, the proofs, of arithmetical truths from logical premises that his theory claimed was possible. In between the foundations and the fundamental laws, Frege published a series of philosophical articles, among them on sense and reference and concept and object, that are now required reading by all students of analytic philosophy. Central to Frege's project was the idea that class is a purely logical notion, derived from quite general considerations about propositions. Every meaningful proposition has a form that can be expressed by a propositional function, and to every propositional function there corresponds a class. In many important respects, the first draft of Russell's The Principles of Mathematics simply duplicated Frege's claims. Russell, too, defined numbers as classes, and he, too, hoped to use that definition as the bedrock of the proof that mathematics was logic. Essentially, Russell's idea was to show that the theory of classes could be used to define Piano's three basic notions and to derive as theorems the five premises Piano had shown to be sufficient for, our, for arithmetic. Only after he had finished the first draft of the Principles of Mathematics did Russell study Frege's work and realize the extent to which he had been anticipated. He decided to add to the book an appendix acknowledging the priority and the importance of Frege's work. However, while writing this, he discovered a contradiction in the notion of class that threatened to blow apart both his logical system and Frege's. This contradiction is now known as Russell's paradox and has become Russell's best known contribution to mathematical logic. It arises from the following considerations. If there are classes, then there are classes of them there is a class of them, namely the class of all classes. This class, however, would be unusual in having itself as a member. Most classes clearly are not members of themselves. The class of men, for example, is not a man. The class of tables is not a table, and so on. Now suppose we construct the class of all classes that do not contain themselves. That is, so to speak, the class of all normal classes. And now ask, is that a member of itself or not? we arrive at a logical impasse. If it is a member of itself, then it is not, since it is the class of all classes that are not members of themselves. And if it is not, then it is. Since if it is not a member of itself, then it does indeed belong to the class of all classes that are not members of themselves. If Russell's delight in contemplating the world of mathematics could be regarded, as he himself was inclined to regard it, as a kind of religion, then this paradox brought him first to the brink of atheism, and then over that brink into the mathematical apostasy that Gödel was later to deplore. Russell felt about the paradox, he later said, much as an earnest Catholic must feel about a wicked pope. He discovered the paradox in 1901 and decided to hold off publishing the principles of mathematics until he found a solution to it, which he thought would not be long in coming. Two years later, he finally published the book, replacing his earlier triumphalism with a frank statement that his project appeared to be threatened by a paradox to which he had failed to find an entirely satisfactory solution, but which he hoped and believed would be solved one day. Frege, on the other hand, announced himself simply defeated. In reply to Russell's letter of 1902, in which Russell informed him of the paradox, Frege wrote, your discovery of the contradiction has surprised me beyond words, and I should almost like to say, left me thunderstruck because it has rocked the ground on which I meant to build arithmetic. Not wanting to build arithmetic on rocky ground, Frege abandoned his belief that mathematics was a branch of logic, and embraced instead the Kantian view that the origins of mathematics lie not in Plato's world of forms, but in our own a priori intuitions of space and time. Mathematics, in this view, was not fundamentally an analytic science, the product of logic and our ability to reason. It is, at bottom, synthetic its origins lying with our ability to use our imagination and our intuitions. This is a view which Russell had advocated in the days when he thought of the world as a bowl of jelly. But his commitment to the world of a bucket of shot was now irrevocable, and though he would abandon his belief in Platonism, he never, throughout his exceptionally long life, abandoned his belief in analysis. The view he ended up with was one 
the truth of which he was persuaded by reading Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus. According to this view, mathematics is not a body of analytic truths about the Platonic realm. It is rather analytic in a much less exalted sense. That's to say, mathematics, like logic, is linguistic. It's a series of tautologies. To know that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is analogous to knowing that a four-legged dog is a dog. Just as one does not need to know anything about the weather to know that the sentence, it is either raining or it is not raining, is true. So one does not need to know anything about the world, either the spatio-temporal world or the world of forms, to know that a triangle has three sides. One just needs to know the meaning of the word triangle. To know a logical or mathematical truth, then, is not to know anything about the world, it is to know something about our language. It is to know something about how we use words, and therefore, about the difference between sense and nonsense. Russell read Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus and adopted his linguistic view of mathematics in 1919, 18 years after discovering the paradox. For much of those 18 years, and especially during the decade between 1901 and 1911, he tried to find a theory that would solve the paradox without surrendering his belief, either in Platonism or in the identity of mathematics and logic. Even before Wittgenstein's influence, he was always more, always more willing to give way on the first than the second, always more willing to abandon Platonism than logicism. Indeed, his thinking took the form of abandoning belief in one platonic entity after another, beginning with classes. The paradox showed, he came to believe at a fairly early stage, that there was, after all, no such thing as a class. There were propositional functions, but it was an illusion that to every propositional function there corresponded a class. It was an illusion he had to identify, explain, and overcome, and though it tends to be forgotten now, it is in pursuit of those aims that he wrote on denoting his celebrated paper of 1905. Since it was published, on denoting has taken on a life of its own and relocated itself away from the philosophy of mathematics and into the philosophy of language. The centerpiece of on denoting is what is now called Russell's theory of descriptions, which says essentially that definite descriptions, that is, descriptions beginning with the word the, such as the present king of France, or more relevantly, the class of all classes that do not contain themselves, are on their own meaningless and acquire a meaning only in the context of a proposition. For Russell, a word or phrase is meaningful only if there is something corresponding to it. And given that, in the light of the paradox, he believed that classes do not exist, it followed that, that phrases that appear to denote classes are meaningless. Those phrases tend to be definite descriptions, and thus Russell developed a theory about definite descriptions in general, namely that they're all meaningless, whether their intended object of denotation exists or not. Sentences that contain definite descriptions are meaningful, Russell concedes, but the meaning they have is disguised rather than revealed by their grammatical structure. So the present king of France's ball, for example, appears to be a subject predicate sentence, but Russell says it's not. Its real logical form is that of a conjunction, a conjunction of three sentences. One, there is at present an X such that X is king of France. Two, there is only one such X. And three, X is ball. The reason this is regarded as such a major contribution to philosophy is because it introduced for the first time what many analytic philosophers regard to be the true purpose of philosophy, namely the identification and analysis of the real logical structures of our language, the structures that are disguised by what Chomsky and others have called surface grammar. Russell was extremely interested in analysing logical form, of course, but for him it was a means to an end rather than an end in itself. And he was always rather baffled to be regarded as a philosopher of language. For him, what was at stake was a view of mathematics, not a view of language. It was this view of mathematics that formed the focus of the long controversy that Russell had with Henri Poincaré, who had always objected to the idea that mathematics was a branch of logic, an idea that seemed to him to strip mathematics of both its beauty and its creativity. Poincaré's view was the Kantian one that Frege was to adopt in his retreat from logicism, namely that mathematics was a synthetic, intuitive activity, the a priority, a priority of which was to do with the nature of our minds, rather than to do with its being based on logic. 
To some extent, Russell owed his reputation in the academic world to Poincaré, and ironically, precisely to Poincaré's Kantianism, since what first drew Russell to the attention of the scholarly community was an appreciative review that Poincaré wrote of Russell's first book, The Foundations of Geometry. This book, written when Russell was still in his jelly phase and disowned by him soon after its publication, put forward a novel defense of a broadly Kantian view of geometry. Kant's view that geometry is a synthetic a priori science, Russell argued, is correct. Only not, as Kant believed, correct about Euclidean geometry, but rather about the then relatively new subject of projective geometry. Unfortunately, an essential element of Russell's defense of this position is now considered to have been shown wrong by Einstein's general theory of relativity. For Russell's view demanded what relativity tells us is not true, namely that if space is curved, its curvature has to be constant. Russell's early theory then, despite being applauded by Poincaré, is now regarded as a rare example of a philosophical theory, the falsehood of which is actually scientifically demonstrable. To Poincaré, though, it was a good deal more sympathetic than the logicism that Russell subsequently adopted. And Poincaré reacted with amused delight when the logicist struggled in the face of the paradox. Logicism is no longer barren, Poincaré announced. It begets contradiction. Where Poincaré had a lasting effect on Russell was in suggesting that at the heart of the contradictions that set theory and logicism faced was a vicious circle principle. This inspired Russell to redraw the rules of his logic so as to forbid any kind of self-reference. But that was clearly not Poincaré's intention. For Poincaré believed that logicism could not possibly escape from the vicious circle, since it was trying to use logic as a foundation for something, namely mathematics, that was actually more fundamental than itself. Nothing could possibly provide the foundation for arithmetic, Poincaré, following Kant, believed since arithmetic was an expression of our most fundamental intellectual intuitions. Despite the enormous respect in which Poincaré was, and to a lesser extent still is, held, his particular form of intuitionism has not been particularly influential. However, in the hands of the fourth philosopher I want to discuss, the Austrian Edmund Husserl, that view became the basis for an entire tradition of philosophy, and arguably for an entire Weltanschauung. Husserl first published his version of this view in his 1887 book on the concept of number. His intention was to combine Platonism with intuitionism, to combine, as he often put it, the subjectivity of knowing with the objectivity of the known. In pursuing the former, his subsequent book, The Philosophy of Arith Arithmetic, introduced a key Husserlian distinction between authentic and symbolic concepts. An authentic concept has its basis in direct intuition, whereas a symbolic concept requires language for its construction and use. So, for example, our concept of the number four is authentic because we can see directly the difference between a group of four things and a group of five things. Our concept of, say, 251, however, is symbolic because we cannot distinguish, except by signs, for example, numerals, a collection of 251 objects from a collection of 250. Arithmetic, Husserl argues, is founded on authentic concepts, since these are required for symbolic concepts to be constructed. Ultimately, therefore, no matter how much we are required to use symbols, the origins of our arithmetical concepts lie in direct intuitions and not symbolic representations. It was this book that received a famous drubbing from Frege, who in his review of it poured vitriol over Husserl's alleged confusion between mathematics and psychology. How we arrive at our mathematical concepts, Frege uh, argued, is of no interest to the mathematician. The mathematician is interested in the foundations of mathematics, not in this psychological sense of the experiential origins of our ideas, but in the sense of the grounds we have, or might not have, for our mathematical beliefs which is not a psychological question, but a logical one. Among analytic philosophers particularly, Frege is widely considered to have won this exchange. And yet, if we move forward a few years to the momentous year of 1905, what, when the mists have cleared, does the philosophical landscape look like? 
Well, Frege has retired hurt, having abandoned his attempt to establish the logicist thesis. He will, however, go on to be acknowledged by a generation of philosophers who were born after he died as the most important philosopher of his time. Russell, meanwhile, in 1905, is struggling to repair the holes in his version of logicism, writing in the process the work that will determine the tone, the content, and the style of analytic philosophy. Though having to suffer in the process the withering scorn of Henri Poincaré, almost universally admired then, and almost universally forgotten now. And what of Husserl? Well, though initially chastened somewhat by Frege's lacerating criticism, he, in 1905, is poised to become the leader of a new movement called phenomenology, the central idea of which is to found philosophy on precisely the kind of direct intuition that the logicists rejected. This movement is, on the whole, confined to the so-called continental tradition, and yet it has received endorsement from at least one unexpected quarter. Kurt Gödel, one of Einstein's closest friends at Princeton, made his reputation largely on the basis of his famous incompleteness theorem of 1931, which is generally regarded as showing that what Frege and Russell dreamed of producing, namely a single theory of logic from whose axioms all of mathematics could be derived, is in principle impossible. Gödel himself believed that philosophically, the main implication of his in incompleteness theorem was to support Platonism, even though it destroyed a dream close to the hearts of two prominent Platonists. Broadly speaking, Gödel believed that Frege and Russell were right about the metaphysics of mathematics, but that the intuitionists were right about the epistemology of it. In other words, what makes, mathem what makes mathematics true, as Platonists claim, is the way the abstract world objectively is. But what enables us to know the truths of arithmetic as intuitionists claim, is a special form of intuition. At Princeton, Gödel was known to be searching for a philosophical theory that would combine these two thoughts, but frustratingly, he never published anything about it. After his death, however, his literary executors went through his papers and revealed that he had spent the last 20 years of his life studying Husserl. The philosophers we've been consider considering shape the development of philosophy during the last hundred years, often in unforeseen ways, and even in ways that run directly contrary to their intentions. Einstein was wrong to think that only Mush would remain from philosophical writing. But he was absolutely right that when looked at a second time, its appearance changes dramatically. The philosophical scene of 1905 looks very different to us than it would have looked to Einstein. Thank you very much, Ray. We have time for a few questions. If you have a question, if you would like to put up your hand, we have uh, ushers with microphones, and if you could wait till a microphone appears. Any questions? Is this on? Um, at the end there, you were talking about um, intuition showing us how to know the, mm -hmm. the world of ideas. And that was based on observations made on simple things like groups of objects, right? How do you think the new development of, of quantum science, which lets us see and, and observe things that, of objects that don't behave like normal objects, will, have, will that have any effect on this world of ideas? That's a very interesting question, thank you. Um, I, I mean, it does, it does challenge, doesn't it, the, the uh, relation, so to speak, between concept and percept. Now, I mean, I mean, that relationship has been of interest to philosophers at least since the time of Kant. And, and Kant says, you know, uh, concepts without intuitions are empty, and intuitions without concepts are blind. But now think about what's happening when you're making observations in quantum physics. 
It might be argued, you know, I, can, I, I, I dare say, you know, somebody has argued this, um, that where what you're seeing challenges your conceptualization, then there's an important respect in which, as Kant says, your intuition is blind. You don't, as it were, know quite what you're seeing. Um, now, I, I mean, changing it from quantum physics to, to, to relativity, um, I'm thinking of the strangeness of conceiving the world. I mean, especially in 1905, think of how strange it would have been to conceive the world like that. For example, you know, conceiving of a, a four-dimensional non-Euclidean space. You know, what, what, what was that like and what is that like now? I mean, isn't there a sense in which, and you know, this is an argument that's been running in philosophy for, well, I would say a hundred years. Isn't there a sense in which we, we can't imagine that space? Um, Strawson, for example, has argued that our, our geometrical intuitions just are Euclidean. That if we're asked to imagine a triangle uh, which has three straight lines, but the angles of which add up to more than 180 degrees, there's a sense in which we can't imagine that, because when we try to picture it, we're picturing bent lines. You know? uh, we're, we're, uh, we're picturing, as it were, curved lines, and then we're not picturing straight lines. Um, so there's a sense in which there you have concepts without corresponding intuitions. And Strawson would argue, and other Kantian philosophers would argue, and therefore those concepts are, in some important sense, uh, empty. Right, so your question though was about Husserl, who, 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 who wanted to apply all this to, to, to mathematics. We've got authentic concepts and we've got symbolic concepts. And Husserl says, we don't understand what we're talking about with these symbolic concepts unless we can trace them back to an authentic concept, a concept that satisfies, as it were, the Kantian criterion of, of being a full-blooded concept, namely, it has a corresponding intuition. Well, I think what Husserl would say, and, and you know, he's not alone in this, there's a whole Kantian tradition, including Strawson, that would say this, but where you can't point to a corresponding intuition, you've got an empty concept. And where, and, and therefore all you've got, so to speak, are words. You, you, I, I mean, so I've, 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 I've heard people argue this about quantum physics. They said, look, it really is a waste of time trying to give you a description of what's happening at a quantum level using ordinary language in ways that would make sense. Because using ordinary language, it just doesn't make sense. This is actually what Russell says in his uh, uh, 1920s book, The ABC of Atoms, in which he, he provided a very early example of a, uh, an attempted popularization of quantum, uh, quantum theory. And what he says there is, look, there's no way I can describe this in ordinary language in such a way as to make sense because it challenges assumptions that are, so to speak, built into ordinary language. You have to learn the theory, you have to learn the mathematics. And once you learn the mathematics and know how to apply the mathematics, then it'll make sense, but then you'll see that it can't be put into ordinary language. Now, what's, what's happening there in this Husserlian Kantian view, the reason it can't be put into ordinary language is because it's, as it were, inauthentic. It's verbal rather than... Uh, uh, you know, something that's uh, attached to our intuitions. I, I mean, I, you know, one could talk about that for ages, but, but d d does that at least address what you, you had in mind? Other questions? Right. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned near the end of your of, of your talk that uh, analytic philosophers generally regard Frege to have been the the victor of this yeah. exchange yeah. Uh, with Husserl, uh, and and then you go on to point out, I think perfectly correctly, that within a few years, uh, Frege's logicist convictions at least were circling the drain, uh, and uh, so it's unclear. I think the suggestion was it's unclear whether that perception is well founded. 
But I, I wonder, and I, uh, I mean, do, do you think it's maybe uh, more that, that, that the contemporary analytic conception of that exchange has to do with defining it kind of locally, that, that whether or not logicism was destined to succeed or fail, uh, uh, what Frege pointed out was that Husserl was making a kind of mistake, right? a kind of general mistake of moving from uh, psychology to virtually any other discipline, right? that, that the remark about uh, the mathematician's interest not being primarily about how we come to acquire certain concepts would work just as well for physics, right? that it's not really the proper essence of physics to go about studying how it is that people that say infants or so forth come to acquire their concepts of space or motion or what have you. Those are interesting topics, but they're not the essence of physics. So I, it didn't seem to me, and, and maybe you can just clarify yeah. your own name, but it didn't, it didn't seem to me that the contemporary analytic philosopher has to be a logicist in order yeah. to think that Frege yeah. won on right. that point. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Um, uh, uh, what you say is right, I think, if Frege's interpretation of Husserl was correct. Um, I mean, I think my, my own view was, would be that Frege has, has been uncharitable in his interpretation of Husserl, so that he, uh, uh, Husserl's conception of, his own conception of what he was up to was um, to do justice to the subjectivity of knowing and the objectivity of the known. Frege, one might argue, and I, I would argue, has concentrated entirely on the first of those. He's, 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 he's writing about Husserl as if Husserl is only interested in the subjectivity of, of knowing. And ignored completely Husserl's interest in the objectivity of the known. Because it is, and, and this is why Husserl appeals to Gödel. I mean, Gödel, you know, is, is, is the Platonist Platonist. You know, you, you can't, um, you can't out-Platonist Gödel. Uh, um, uh, he, um, and, and what he saw in Husserl's work was precisely that Platonism, precisely a determination to preserve the objectivity of the known. In this case, the, 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 the real existence of the mathematical objects. It's just that Husserl was interested in something that Frege just wasn't interested in, namely the subjectivity of knowing. And, and this does, I think, I, I mean, this is still a live issue in contemporary philosophy uh, between, for example, Michael Dummett and, and David Bell. Um, the issue being, I mean, Dummett says about Frege um, that one of his great achievements on which analytic philosophy has built is, uh, 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 in, in Dummett's phrase, the extrusion of thoughts from the mind. You know, to take a notion of thought and say, look, this has got nothing to do with the mind, with thinking. A thought is something, as it were, uh, an objective content. You and I can have the same thought. Well, okay, but one wants to say, well, surely that's not the whole of it. I mean, there, there is a sense in which, you know, uh, if you extrude thoughts from the mind, you've extruded, you, you, you've, you've um, removed something from the notion of the thought, which is why we're interested in them in the first place. Um, so, if Husserl was saying that the philosopher should be concerned only with mathematical thinking and not with the objectivity or otherwise, the, the defense, the, 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 the uh, grounds we have for thinking, what we do think about mathematics, uh, then Frege is justified. But, but I think. Um, I think there's a more charitable uh, view to be taken. Thank you.